Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really honored that you took time to come and see me talk. Um, I should tell you, first off, I have a, a terrible migraine headache. <laughs> and I spent uh, most of today up till about 4 p.m. laying on the floor. And, but then I put on my power blazer, so I'm going to be fine. <laughs> but if you see me staring off into space, uh, looking like I might die, that's the reason. Uh, <laughs> I'll survive. Um, I also wanted to say, over on the table there, there are some uh, zines and stickers. Um, I figured my, my talk today is very, is very practical. Um, as you heard from Charlene's introduction, I do a million different things. And so today I'm going to really dig down on about six different projects that I do and talk about how those are made and get pretty practical about how journalism works these days. Um, and I figured at Reed, you know, you get a lot of like heady academic philosophical talks. So in contrast to that, I'm going to be really super practical and down to earth. But I do love that heady philosophical academic stuff. So I made it into a zine that I published over there. And so if you want to read more big thoughts about how media works, especially about um, Facebook and Twitter and uh, how we, what we sell from, of ourselves to have discourse online, it's in the zine. Check it out. Uh, there's also some stickers from the nib. Um, OK, so this is me. Uh, oftentimes, people ask, when they ask, what do you do, I say, Oh, I'm a journalist, and then they're like, oh, well, like, but like, what do you like actually like? What 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 does that mean? What do you do? So, <laughs> here's what being a journalist looks like these days. Um, uh, I have about maybe 20 different jobs. I write nonfiction comics. I, I I edit other people's writing. I manage social media accounts. I make podcasts. I write chapters for books. I make a lot of zines and diary comics. I write for Publishers Weekly. I do political reporting. I teach in an MFA program. I also volunteer as a teacher. And I also wrote a book about sex and dating, working on a graphic novel and a young adult novel. Also, I draw comics like, does anybody need anything drawn? I'm always happy to do that. <laughs> um, and so this is something I think about because for basically my entire career, I'm 31 now, and I'm one of those people who's always wanted to be a journalist. Um, for my entire career, people have told me that uh, journalism is dead, that print is dead. And uh, I just haven't found that to be true. In my experience, print isn't dead, it's diversified. So now there are way fewer people who are able to graduate from college and go and get like a staff job at a newspaper that lasts them for the next 40 years, or get a staff job at a TV station um, that they do for you know, the next 30 years. Instead, the economy of labor we're seeing now in journalism looks a lot more like mine, where people are maybe doing a job at a media outlet for a year or two or three, and then moving on to another one, but at the same time, Every young person I know who's in journalism has about 10 different side hustles. And so you're not just working for one media outlet, you're working for 10 different media outlets, or working as a teacher, and an artist, and a writer, and a filmmaker. And that's the media landscape right now. And from, it works well for somebody like me who's OK with a little bit of chaos and a little bit of flexibility. It's harder if you have more things hanging over your head, like massive debt you have to pay off, or a mortgage, or somebody else you're taking care of, like a kid or maybe your parents, then you have less flexibility and you're less OK with chaos. Um, I, what I'm able to do uh, is follow my curiosity with my work. That's why, as, as you heard, I'm able to just sort of do whatever I'm interested in and whatever medium I'm interested in. And that's changed a lot over the years. When I started out, I was working primarily for newspapers writing uh, online and in print. And then I got interested in making radio and making podcasts. And now I make comics. And uh, basically, what I'm interested in is storytelling and finding the mediums that fit those stories best. The big question, oh, and these days I work for The Nib, uh, which we publish. Uh, we're a nonprofit independent media outlet. And we're, we publish comics from people all over the world about politics and culture. And so we employ people working uh, in countries around the world to write about the situations that are going on where they are. Last week, for example, we published a really long comic about life in Tunisia um, right now and the violence that's going on there, as well as daily, down, like, really funny stuff about who Trump fired this week. And uh, that, I think that sounds really cool. We work with, um, mm, I think, about over 100 artists a year from around the world. And I edit their work and help get it published. I think that sounds really like glamorous and prestigious, so I should let you know that actually most of my days are spent hanging out at my house with my cat. <laughs> I work from home. Um, let me see if I can get this little video to play of my cat looking back and forth. I work from home, and so I just sit there with my cat all day, uh, reading the internet and writing things. 
<laughs> there's no like there's no like big you know fancy office on the top of big pink it's just me in my house with my cat and that's that's really what uh being a freelancer looks like these days too um and but, uh, before then, I worked for the last four years for, for Bitch, which is based here in town. I love Bitch, and um, covered feminism and pop culture issues there. So my job with there is, was the online editor. So I did all the digital content, including running all our social media um, and recruiting writers and publishing their work. So at Bitch, I actually worked with about 150 writers a year and edited their work on everything from you know writing about the Academy Awards and, and racial diversity there. Um, to police brutality and police violence and getting their perspectives there. And the big question that's guided my work in, in every different medium, it doesn't matter what medi medium it is, this is the question that I'm always asking myself, is how do you actually get people to listen to you? And like, what do people actually retain? What do people remember? Like, can you remember stories that you read or that you heard that were from like five years ago? What sticks out to you? And that's, that's always the kind of journalism that I want to do, is the stuff that sticks with people and actually um, gets them to think about something new or think about a new perspective. And that's really, really difficult to do. <laughs> so what I'm going to share today is uh, six different lessons I've learned from all these different projects to try and get you to think about this question of like, how do you make media in a way that sticks with people? And one of the first big lessons I learned uh, was about data. So, I'm very passionate about prison uh, reform and changing the way we incarcerate people in the United States. And when I was in college, I uh, taught in a prison. I, was a, I volunteered as a teacher in a prison in Iowa. And I became really passionate about this topic. And I was constantly yelling at people about the numbers, about the data on like how many people we incarcerate. Just look at the graph. This is ridiculous. You know, when you look at the numbers, uh, it can, it's, it's pretty stark in my mind that we're doing something wrong. And so, you know, I would like actually had like graphs on my phone would be like, look at this graph. <laughs> or trying to tell people like, you know, we incarcerate, you know, more people than anywhere else in the world, this many people a day, this many people in total. And eventually another journalist gave me some really good advice, which is that stories are stronger than data. Just yelling at people about numbers doesn't work that well to get them to listen to you and to get them to remember uh, what you've said. So if you're yelling about, uh, you know, there's this many million people in prison, people are kind of like, yeah, and they glaze over. But what really sticks with people is stories. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be factual database stories, but you have to figure out how to convey that data in a really narrative-driven way. So here are some examples. Uh, so when I was a bitch, I hosted a podcast called Propaganda that's about feminism and pop culture. And when, we were, when uh, I would make a show about prisons, I was like, okay, What's a story we can tell about prisons? And um, I started reading the work of this really interesting woman, um, Andrea James, who wrote a book about being an incarcerated mother in prison. And for me, her story was just really heart-wrenching and also brought that human perspective to this issue that's actually, when you think about it, not just about numbers and data, it's about the people involved. And instead of telling a big story of everybody and like, here's the big problem, let's just focus on her story and what's going on with her. And through her story, you can understand the bigger picture. So um, I talked to her specifically about how in prison, a lot of times you don't, it's, you can't um, give visits to see people. In her case, she was incarcerated pretty far away from where her kids were. So it was a really arduous journey for them to get there. And they're, I mean, they're kids. It's hard for them to come to the prison. It costs a lot of money. So you wind up doing a lot of parenting over, over the phone, over the phone in prison. And I talked to her about that story of like, what it's like to try and talk to your teenage daughter about what's going on in her life over a phone that you're only allowed to talk on for 15 minutes. How do you become a parent that way? Um, and we put this, that story with Andrea James into a, into a podcast about, about prisons being a feminist issue. And that's an example of the way that I want to tell a specific story to try and get at, a, at an issue that um, will hopefully stick with people rather than just hitting them with the numbers of like, Here's why prison is bad. Another example of that is, um, this is all the way you can remember back in the days of July 2017, six months ago. Um, there were some really big uh, fights going on uh, about healthcare funding. And uh, the Republicans were threatening to, to yank a lot of healthcare funding from people. So healthcare is like a classic issue 
where there's a lot of numbers there, there's a lot of data there. Um, how do you actually get people to care about it? I mean, even when I say the word healthcare, I feel like people's eyes just glaze over and they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about it, it's healthcare. <laughs> so what I tried to do for this podcast, which is called Life in Late Capitalism, is I interviewed uh, this woman uh, who was a protester. I don't know if any of you saw this photo, um, but she has actually, she uses a wheelchair and she uh, went to go protest at Senator Mitch McConnell's office, along with a bunch of other people who um, uh, are, are in wheelchairs, and they were dragged out by the police and then had their hands zip tied. And so uh, I saw that photo, I saw this photo on Twitter and was like, wow, I wanna know the story behind that photo. What the heck happened there? What's her perspective? What is, what is she thinking about this? Uh, that's the way that I want to tell the story about healthcare cuts, is what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to people like her? Let's focus on that little story to try and get at this big picture story that's going to overwhelm people if you just try to tell it with data. So, um, and I think this is a really powerful story in itself that, you know, all these people with disabilities went to Mitch McConnell's office and put their bodies on the line to try and save healthcare funding. Like, geez, oh, that's really powerful. So that became part of the podcast. Um, on life in late capitalism. Okay, second piece of lesson learned. People ask me all the time, like, how do I become a writer? How do I do the job that you do? And this is my, this is my big piece of advice. If you wanna be a writer, write. <laughs> it, can be, it can be anywhere, but if you see something that you wanna write about, start writing about it. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I had like a bunch of complicated stuff going on in my relationships, and I basically was trying to figure out how do people decide to keep dating somebody or to break up with them or who to date or whether they should get married or whether they should have kids. And me, I'm like kind of a nerd, so when I have a relationship problem, <laughs> the first place I turn is the bookstore. Is there a book about this that I can just read and absorb that knowledge? So I went to Powell's and looked at the relationship section I don't know if you guys have spent much time in like the relationship section of the bookstore recently. It is very bad. This is, <laughs> I just took a screenshot. This is, this is last week, Amazon's best sellers in the dating category. Can we just talk about these books for a second? So <laughs> number one is Text So Good He Can't Ignore Them by Bruce Bryans. And then the second book is Never Chase Men Again, also by Bruce Bryans. <laughs> so what's the message here? Are you supposed to send the text he can't ignore? or you're not chasing the man? Are you, which type of social manipulation and emotional labor are you performing? A or B? I don't know, Bruce. Um, there's also the 31 Prayers for My Future Husband is right up there. Um, Why Men Love Bitches, which <laughs> is one of the book, a lot of like relationship books are basically like, here's the silver bullet. You act like this. There's also, um, here's some more. Uh, there's like, you act like a bitch and then he'll love you. And there's also uh, the, the Man God Has For You, a really popular book called Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. Um, he's not that interested, he's just passing time. 31 Prayers for a Future Wife, A Couple's Devotional. These are rooted, a lot of the best-selling relationship books are rooted in religion, they're rooted in Christianity and a Christian ethos of what a healthy relationship looks like. They're also really rooted in a distinct gender binary <laughs> characterized by really old school, traditional, outdated norms. Uh, act like a lady, think like a man is a good example of that one. I also, some of the other most popular relationship books out there right now, I mean, these are bestsellers, are written by pickup artists. Do you guys know what pickup artists are? Okay, uh, pickup artists are like men who employ a series, like a category of, uh, of behaviors to try and snag women that involve things like um, insulting them, negging them, so that then they love you and they want to be with you. A lot of these books are written by this guy whose name is literally Mystery. <laughs> so <laughs> another best-selling book right now, another best-selling relationship book is this, The Power of the Pussy, If Men Are Dogs, This Is Animal Control. And, <laughs> and here are some of the uh, basic tenets of the book. I just don't want anything to do with any of these books. And what I think about from a relationship is I don't want to figure out how to like snag a man and get him to marry me. I don't want to get my relationship advice from the Bible. That's not my values. I don't want to have a relationship advice that's based on emotional manipulation and lying to people and trying to trick them into dating me. I just want to be happy and healthy and figure out what I want and figure out how to express it. And so 
I saw that there really wasn't a, a modern, current dating guide uh, out there for somebody like me who was interested in those things. So I decided that I should write it because I didn't see the kind of representation that I wanted in that form of pop culture. I decided I, I'm going to make my own representation here. I'm going to I'm going to make my own media in this case. I started writing this book um, called Sex from Scratch: Making Your Own Relationship Rules, where I went around the country and I interviewed about a hundred different people about their relationships and the conflicts that they came up in their relationships and how they solved those conflicts or how they didn't and what they're still working on. And I focused on people in like non-traditional relationships. So people who are non-monogamous in open relationships or open marriages, uh, people who've decided that they're never gonna have kids, people who've decided that they're never gonna get married, people who identify as gender queer or non-binary. Because I thought that those people would have done some critical thinking about their relationships to have, to have figured out, oh, I want something that looks different than what I see on TV. I'm gonna figure out how to get there. So I interviewed them, really, it's a book about critical thinking skills, <laughs> but that's not like as marketable. So, <laughs> um, and what I came up with is actually, I thought that there would be more uh, like do this, don't do that kind of advice. But instead the advice that people had was not of the silver bullet list of algorithms at all that you can actually do to have a healthy relationship. What they had instead was more um, theoretical approaches to how you approach yourself and approach a relationship, such as relax, listen, ask questions is one of those pieces of advice, which I find myself using again and again and again when I'm in points of conflict or turmoil in a relationship, I think. Just relax, listen, ask questions. And so that book came out uh, in 2014 and uh, it was pretty cool to see it out there in the world. And now it's really, really nice and powerful because I hear all the time from people who read the book and it was helpful to them and they send me Facebook messages about like, here's the conversation I had with my ex-girlfriend about this book. And I love that. I love that, you know, I saw something that I felt like was missing from our media landscape. I was able to make that piece of media and then people find it useful even four years down the road. People also message me and say, hey, I liked your book, but like this was missing, this was missing, I want to know more about that. I like that feedback too. I think that's really useful. And to me, that means people are, are reading and being critical and that's, that's really special and important. Um, okay, third piece of advice. You guys following so far? So people are taking notes, that's wonderful. Um, I try to start every project that I'm working on by listening and learning, and a, a central to the work that I do, regardless of the medium, is collaborating with people who are smarter than me, uh, or more compassionate than me, or more talented than me in some way, and we can together make work that's better. So I want to talk through one project I made that started with listening and learning and collaboration. And that's uh, maybe, geez, how many years ago was that? Many years ago, six years, let's say. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got an email from a, a woman who had served as a veteran. She was a veteran of Guantanamo Bay. She worked in the Navy um, and had been stationed in Guantanamo and then came back into civilian service and didn't know how to process her time there. She felt like she'd seen a lot of things that she really didn't agree with. She had seen a lot of friends who were sexually assaulted. She had seen just the, the horrors of being involved in, in, our, in a war on terror in, in, in the way that she was, as, um, in the role that she was playing there. And she didn't know how to process all of that, the good and the bad. So she, she like emailed me and said, hey, I've seen you written about Guantanamo stuff a little bit in the past. Uh, can I just get coffee and talk to you about my experience and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, her name is Laura Sandow and um, she was this time was a student at PSU. And she and I together after we got coffee decided what we should do is um, make a comic based on her experiences um, at Guantanamo. So the, one of the big problems that she had is she had no way to talk about her experiences. She didn't know how to tell the story of her time there. And I think narrative is a really powerful healing tool and, and powerful processing tool. So like, what's the story that you tell about this complicated time in your life, both to yourself and to others? What's the story that you tell of this situation that makes no sense to you? And how do you make that into something you can actually articulate to others and communicate with others? And so I interviewed her about her experiences, and then she and I together interviewed another female veteran about her experiences at Guantanamo and then um, got artist Lucy Bellwood, who's actually a Reed alum, uh, and Lucy illustrated the story for us. And it became probably the piece of journalism I'm like, I think I'm most proud of in my life, where 
uh, so Laura felt like she was able to take this comic that we made that was published initially by Symbolia magazine and then was reprinted by um, Pen American. And she was able to take this comic and both share it with people in her life who she didn't know how to tell her story to. So she actually sent the comic and then also printed off uh, print versions of it and would carry it around and give it to people in her family or her coworkers or other people who would ask, had asked like, oh yeah, like what happened to you there? She'd be like, oh look, here's the thing I wrote about it. <laughs> you can read it, I can share it that way rather than having to go through this like heart-wrenching tale every time. Um, and then also it just helped her get her story out there to the rest of the world rather than feeling like, wow, I was part of this big thing and it just happened to me and I feel really small. It was an empowering process for her to feel like, oh, I can tell my story to millions of people rather than just keeping it in me. Um, and this comic has gone on and had a whole life of its own online and in print. It actually wound up in the Portland Art Museum as part of the Object Stories collection, which I think is really cool. And people just find it all the time and stumble across it and email me about it. And I love that, where it went from being just like, okay, like, what should we do? Uh, you have this experience, I don't know what to do about it, you don't know what to do about it. The, way, the place to start that is by, is by listening and learning as much as possible before we started into the project. So listening to her, listening to other people with those experiences, and then deciding what we're gonna do. I think if I had started out with the mindset of, I'm gonna write a comic about Guantanamo, it wouldn't have been that good at all because I would have been coming to it from just my perspective and maybe that wasn't the right angle for it. You know, maybe if I wanted to tell a story about Guantanamo, I should have done it as a podcast or I should have done it as one article that I write. But it was really, you know, working with somebody who has experienced those things who said, okay, here's, we're gonna figure out together what the, what the best way to tell this story is um, and how to do it. And I have a lot of stories that I've heard or that I've experienced that so far haven't become any media project. I'm still trying to figure out what the heck to do with them and the best way to tell them. And I hope that you know, uh, in 60 years I'll have told every story I want to tell. <laughs> but I doubt it. I bet I'll like, be on you know, my deathbed being like, wait, I have more things. <laughs> and, uh, the other big thing, and this is the focus of tomorrow's zine workshop, is that you don't need permission to publish your work. Right now we have all the tools you need to publish your own work, either as a zine or you can do it online, you have all of the tools you need. And I think that's really powerful to acknowledge that in this narrative around you know, print being dead, journalism being dead, uh, what's gone away is a lot of the gatekeepers there. And so I, I think it's really sad that we have, we've had a real decline of local journalism and funding for local reporters in our country. But the flip side of that is that like, these days it's easier now than ever to get your own work out there. And you don't have to get somebody else to sign off on it. I think about like 40 years ago, if you were a person who had something to say on an issue, how would you get it out to thousands of people? You'd write a letter to the editor of the newspaper and hopefully they would publish, they would decide to publish it. Or if you had enough money, you could maybe print it as a, as a newsletter yourself, or you could submit an idea to a publisher um, and have an editorial board say yes or no, we're going to publish this book or not. Nowadays, if you have something you want to share, you can share it in a variety of different mediums, basically instantly and for very little money. So it's a much more accessible world now. Um, one project that I like to point to is I make, the other stuff I've talked about was professional work that I did for money. Just for fun, I love drawing comics and I draw comics about my life and my experiences, they're called diary comics is the genre of comics that I draw. And I just publish them on Instagram. And uh, I also sometimes print them out and give them to people. But I publish them this way because they're just things about my life that I want to share and get out there that I feel the need to compel, to compel to tell people about. But I don't want to like write a book proposal about it. I don't want to publish them two years from now. I just want to share it with people right now. So I was going to show you one comic that I drew that I just published on Instagram. And uh, I think they're really fun. So this is me, obviously. Oh my God. Oh, um, what, what's going on, Hunter, are you okay? The new planet Earth is on Netflix, finally. Must save her, so precious. Midnight. Snakes, so many snakes. 1 a.m., baby spider monkey, your family loves you. <laughs> 2 a.m., the wasp, it's stealing your babies, kill it. 6 a.m., you okay, hon? Humans. <laughs> We are a menace. We must be destroyed. 
<laughs> Has anyone else here like watched all of planet Earth and come to the same conclusion? Great, I'm so glad. So this is something that I just made this for fun, just to share with my friends and to share an experience I had. And I feel really lucky that I have the uh, tools to be able to publish it right away without needing to uh, get anyone else to sign off or even do that great of a job with the drawings. Um, the other next big message I have is that our pop culture actually matters a lot. Um, uh, I recently did wrote a comic about Laura Croft, uh, who's the star of Tomb Raider, and so this is a work that this is a piece of work that I did for the NIP for the comics publication. So in this case, I wrote the text here, so I did the research and wrote this comic, and then the artist Isabella Rotman drew it. So I'm going to show you a couple panels of the comic and just tell you what it's about. Um, so, Lara Croft is the tough as nails star of 17 video games and three movies, including one coming out this spring. She's the iconic fictional character at the center of the money minting Tomb Raider series. Lara is a badass, kill or be killed adventuring archaeologist. But when she debuted, she was better known for something else her boobs. Tomb Raider. This is the actual 1996 tagline sometimes a killer body just isn't enough. Over her 20 years on screen, Lara's look has changed significantly. The story behind her design and evolution shows the larger shifting patterns around gender and race in the video game industry. Uh, this is a look at Lara Croft over the years from 1997 all the way to 2013. Um, Tomb Raider was created in the 90s by a small British development shop called Core, Core Design. All six staffers at the time were men. That's not surprising. Even today, only 22% of video game developers are women. And here's a breakdown in the distribution of video games, uh, video, game, game, uh, video game gamers and developers by sex in 2016. So you can see the sex of gamers is um, about 60% men and 40% women, and the sex of developers is much more out of whack than that. Tomb Raider's developers initially envisioned her, their protagonist as a dude but the treasure hunter was too clearly an Indiana Jones ripoff. So they changed the hero to a woman, a South American antiquities expert named Laura Cruz. But when, Cor when Core's parent company, Eidos, saw the concept, they balked. Management demanded a more UK-friendly name, so Laura Cruz became the white, upper crusty Brit, Laura Croft. Then one day, the lead artist accidentally slipped up and increased Laura's breast size by 150%. The joke stuck. Tomb Raider aspired to a realistic design of its digital world, but marketing loved the new absurdly giant breasts. What better way to show off the game's cutting-edge 3D design than with triple D boobs? Um, numerous women have pointed out to me after this comic was published that her boobs are not triple D, they're more like HH. And <laughs> I made this, I did that in this panel because I wanted to go for the 3D triple D pun that absolutely nobody got except for me. <laughs> but the pawn is there in my heart, and I had to do it. <laughs> um, so I would say that is a legitimate criticism of the comic, is somebody saying, actually, it's not Triple D, they're more like HH. What are you doing? I, I, I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll try and work with that. A criticism that, I, that this kind of work often gets is more along the lines of, why are you writing about pop culture while people are dying? Why are you writing about something like Lara Croft when there's other terrible things in the world that are happening. This happens, this happens with every single thing that pretty much ever I've ever published. Uh, here's an example of one of those pieces of criticism. This is the post about the comic on Instagram from the Nib, and somebody says, in other news, the Syrian civil war turned seven years old this past Thursday. Both superpowers involved have no concrete plans to actually stop the war, stop the bloodshed, but fuck that, right? Let's make a comic about pointy tits instead of shitty, 19, about, of shitty 1990s graphics instead. So the point they're making there is like, how can you be writing about pop culture when people are dying? Why aren't you writing all the time nonstop about the Syrian civil war? And the response that I have to that is that this pop culture is the stories that we tell about ourselves. It's the way that we express our values as a society. It's the way that we express what's important to us and the way that we communicate about who we are and what we want in the world. And those stories are important. And I think it's really important to talk about the disparities behind how those stories are told. So for example, this is a chart I put together in 2015, so I think these numbers have changed a little bit. But at that time, of the biggest, the biggest film studios in Hollywood uh, and the biggest TV studios in Hollywood were almost an exclusively white male run. Uh, 
the same thing with Hollywood gender diversity. You've seen the, the Oscars to white movement uh, where there's a, the vast majority of people both on screen and behind the screen are white and people of color are often left out of those pop culture narratives. Um, here's another chart about industry inequality in filmmaking. For every five men working in the film industry, there's one woman. And I want to ask about, like, I always think about, like, what's, what's the impact of that? What impact does it have on our pop culture that it's, it's, it's disproportionately created by white people and by cisgender men? What impact does that have? I think it's really important to talk about those disparities. I think it's important to talk about that impact. And I think it's important to reflect on once those pieces of pop culture are made, how they're received, and how the people who make the pop culture shape what it is. Um, for example, this is from that same study, uh, that only 30% of speaking characters in the biggest uh, 100 films released in Hollywood are, only 30% of those speaking characters are women. That's definitely shaped by who's making those films, who's writing them, who's directing, who's producing. Um, we also see that uh, this is a chart about how the glass ceiling is still very intact on screen. So these are the roles that women play in movies. So when you look at the credits for who's credited as nurse, 89% of people who played nurses in movies are women. Uh, only 5% of people who played presidents in movies are women. How does that impact the way that we see nursing and the way that we see Who's, who can be president. I think a lot of pop culture helps us envision, helps us both reflect the way the world is and envision the way that the world can change and the way the world can be different. It's hard to imagine something that we've never seen or heard before. It's hard to imagine the world being different if we never hear those stories. Um, it's also a very straight world on screen. How does, it, how does it impact our understanding of ourselves and impact our understanding of the world uh, if it looks like 96% of people in the world are straight. Uh, uh, the pop culture writer Alyssa Rosenberg, who works for the Washington Post, did this, asked this really great question, which is, what would the world look like if it reflected the composition of primetime network TV? <laughs> Half the world would be white men. Just 1.9% of the world would be Asian or Latino men. 34% of the world would be white women. 31.8% would work for the police or some sort of federal law enforcement agency. I think mostly due to the endless law and order and CSI spinoffs. <laughs> like everybody's an FBI agent or uh, you know, employed by in criminal minds. And 1.9% would be a supernatural creature or robot. <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping for personally. Um, but just think about it. You know, I, think it's, I think it's really important for us to think about you know, what does that lack of represent how does that lack of representation affect us personally and as a society? And it's not something that there's an easy answer to, it's just a rhetorical question. Um, but I do have some answers, which is, I like this, I put together this little presentation of terrible relationship advice I learned from TV and movies. Um, because I think, especially from a dating and, and sexuality perspective, it's, it's important to think about, okay, who are writing the movies that we're seeing that are portraying the way that relationships can be? Bringing it back to the, the research I was doing on the book that I wrote, what are the stories we're telling about relationships? And what kind of role models do we have? A lot of the role models we look up to, we look up to maybe our parents or other family members, our friends, but film and TV is a big place where we learn about like how our lives can be. So uh, who can name this movie? Nobody? One of the Twilights. One of the Twilights, okay, yeah, thank you. It's Twilight, and uh, in this movie, there's basically a love triangle, they're all competing after each other, and a big message of this movie is that jealousy is the equivalent of love. That really, if you're in love with somebody, you should be ragingly jealous in order to uh, compete with other people to win their love. Uh, uh, who can name this show? Anybody? The Bachelor. Thank you. You guys, you all over here, Nailin. <laughs> the Bachelor. Uh, can you explain the premise of The Bachelor? Yeah. So on both The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Uh, there's one person who's like the eligible bachelor, bachelorette, and then there's, uh, I think, a dozen people, 13 people, who compete to win them every season. And that sends the clear message that dating is a competition. It's not something that we do with mutual respect and honesty and communication. You fight each other and one person wins in the end. Um, Aladdin? Yeah, I, I think one message from this movie is that if you have a crush on somebody, you should completely lie about who you are in order to get with them. <laughs> Pretend you're a prince, don't tell the truth, it's terrible. Um, 
say anything. I do love say anything, but come on. He's kind of a stalker. <laughs> if, if I looked outside and a guy I didn't want to talk to was standing there holding up a boom box, I'd be like, run away. Uh, friends, the season finale, I think one of the messages here is that all good relationships end in marriage, which this isn't true. You can have great relationships that you wind up breaking up, you know, great relationships where you wind up maybe getting married and getting divorced again, and that's the way that a healthy relationship looks like. So I think about, okay, well, when we're thinking about who's making our pop culture, what sort of stories are they telling, what sort of messages are we sending, and how is that determined by who's making that culture? Um, uh, I work right now on making a piece of pop culture, which is this animated series from The Nib, where we, uh, it's, they're super short videos, the videos are 30 seconds long to 90 seconds long. So, short, because they're made for YouTube and people don't watch long videos. And they're political satire. And this has been a really fun experience for me. I never thought of myself as somebody who would do comedy writing for animated videos, uh, but that's the way it's wound up. And uh, one video I wanted to tell, I wanted to talk about is, I wanted to make a video about climate change. And, uh, but it has to be funny. So how do you make a funny video about climate change? Um, so the first thing I did was started off with writing a script. So here's the script that I wrote. Um, the piece is called Hot in Here, because I thought we could use that song, and it turns out you can't. <laughs> it's totally copyrighted, and you would get sued. But uh, I was thinking, okay, to call the piece Hot in Here, and it's set, um, I'll just redo the intro. A huge convention center stage festooned with red balloons and American flags. On stage is a podium in the center. Trump is standing there, barely visible. Behind him, a jumbo screen that stretches from one side of the stage to the other displays his face. A big banner hanging on the top of the screen says, Republican National Convention 2024. In the foreground of the scene are black silhouettes of the backs of convention goers and audience members who are waving their arms. The place is obviously packed. We hear the sound of the crowd for a beat before Trump starts his speech. My fellow Americans. So I thought of setting this piece at the Republican National Convention in 2024 so we could talk about what, how we're gonna be talking about climate change uh, you know, about eight years in the future. And in my conception of the script, Republicans have uh, actually embraced climate change because climate change is good for business. They are, they're excited about the benefits that climate change brings in terms of melting the sea caps to get better trade with Russia and that sort of thing. And so what we did here is uh, an artist named Maki Naro uh, did the thumbnails here. He thumbnails it out. This is called a thumbnail because um, making a really small little drawing of what it's gonna look like. And then you go from making a thumbnail doing the inks and colors. And then that's given to a team of animators who actually uh, bring it to life. And I have the animated video that I'm gonna show you here. Let me make sure I don't have any more process slides. Oh yeah, so here we go. I'm gonna show you the finished animated video about that, that I wrote that he um, did, so let's go. My fellow Americans, thank you, thank you. I am honored to accept your nomination for my third term as your president. And let me say to the losers that didn't vote for me, I hope you're enjoying Guantanamo Bay. I look out at all of you, Republicans, Redditors, Minutemen, Handmaids, Nazis, Pizza Gators, Kid Rock, voting delegates from our friends in Russia, and I see the future. Our future is a tremendously big opportunity opportunity. Our opponents say those opportunities are sad, okay, very sad. Our country and the rest of the world is getting hotter. It's 2024. We're ready to say it. Climate change is real. Real good! Turn up the heat, people, okay? Let's hear some f noise. Every year since 2014, we've hit a global heat record, okay? That means more bikinis! Okay, who doesn't love a sexy prime piece of woman in a teeny weeny bikini? Okay, the ice caps, they're melting. All right, that means more trade routes to Russia. We're in the middle of a global mass extinction, which means no more sharks. Stamped on global warming, bro. Rising sea levels are flooding our cities, okay, which means more money for boat builders. So many boats. I mean, you won't believe this. Lots, lots of rigging. And I'm not talking about the election. Increasingly dangerous megastorms means more beautiful family time, okay? And that's what really matters, family.
Well, I like him. Straight shooter, you know? Patriotic. Yeah, maybe we should give him another chance. I mean, how bad could he be? <laughs> God dang it. Do we have the backup generator? Nah, I had to barter it for the toothpaste. No oh, nuts. <laughs> so, what's the point of that video? <laughs> Not really. I think about, like, what's the point? What's the audience there? What is the point of making that kind of video? For me, it's both it's political satire. It's pointing out the absurdity of our situation right now, the absurdity of where it's going to go in the future, and trying to, through humor, get people to recognize how ridiculously screwed up our situation is. Um, and what's, what's interesting about this video particularly is that uh, it came out over the summer, and then uh, very quickly after that, actually, a Republican wrote an editorial in favor of climate change uh, saying that climate change, don't believe the hysteria over carbon dioxide, his reasoning, uh, as the Earth warms, we're seeing beneficial changes to the Earth's geography. For example, Arctic sea ice is, is decreasing. This development will create new commercial shipping lanes, will provide faster, more convenient, and less costly routes between the ports of Asia, Europe, and eastern North America. And I was like, that's what I just said in the video, making fun of you. <laughs> and so in this case, it's trying to point out that like this is not normal. And I hope that the videos that I make, there, the whole point of them is to both, both make people laugh who, in a commiserating kind of way to make people feel like, okay, we have some community here, but also just that uh, I feel like our, our news media uh, in the Trump era has been far too much uh, like trying to take a very like neutral point and be just like, well, this is happening and these people say this thing and these people say this thing and I'm like watching the TV just screaming at it or listening to the radio being like, this is ridiculous. And so that's the tone I'm trying to hit with these videos is saying like, this is not a normal thing that's happening. This is really absurd and ridiculous and we need to do something about it and we should be able to uh, both laugh at the situation we're in from a dark humor perspective, but also recognize that like it is, we are all gonna die. So <laughs> we should do something about it. And, um, and that's why I think that kind of pop culture matters. I feel like we're not seeing the kind of representation I wanna see on TV around political discussions of Trump and especially environmentalism. And so in making this video, I'm sort of trying to push people to think about those things and see like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not okay. It's actually very, very bad. And uh, the kinds of conversations we're actually happening right now are, are so ridiculous that they're easy to lampoon and then turn into real life. Um, my final message that I, wanna, that I wanna bring up for you guys, this is the last lesson of the evening is uh, that capitalism is killing us all. And in your work as a journalist and as an artist and as a writer, the, the big thing I've learned is that this work never ends. Um, it's something that, that every day and every week you can do more about. Every, every day something new and terrible happens. Um, and in my first like eight years as a journalist, I just worked all the time. When I worked at Bitch, I literally like, didn't take a vacation day for like two years because I was so uh, passionate and invested in the work and was like, how can I take a break when like terrible things are happening all of the time? How can I take a break when there's, when there's new things to be written about every day and new people to be published? I'm like, we've got to just work as hard as we possibly can to try and fight this. Um, and I totally wore myself out and, and uh, got pretty burned out on that. And since then I've learned uh, really the power of taking breaks, both for myself, practicing self-care, and then also the power of building community and that it's actually really important to not just you know, sit hunched over a computer working as hard as you possibly can all the time. It's important to take time and ability to establish friendships, to establish relationships, to build community around you. A book about this that I really like that just came out last year is called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. And it's about uh, healthier approaches to activism. Um, she says in that book that one of my favorite questions today is, how will we turn our collective full body intelligence towards collaboration if that's the way that we will survive? And so I think that collaboration is key. What she really stresses in this book is that it's not just, you make a bigger difference by networks working together rather than just individuals working alone. And so I think a lot of times artists, creative people and media makers, myself included, can get too focused down on just doing our own thing and doing it as hard and as much as possible. And it's super important to build those networks and build those connections and to see that as something that's important to do and take time for. So that means making time to have dinner with people, making time to 
to see your friends, making time to go to events and support people that you like, because those are the things that build connect connections and uh, build community, and you shouldn't feel like that's a guilty pleasure at all. So especially for readies who I feel like are too focused down on, <laughs> just like, gotta get this thesis done. And what's so valuable are those connections around you. So make time for fun and make time for those friendships. So here are my six lessons really fast. Uh, in case you didn't take notes, you can just take a photo now. You did a great job. Um, and uh, people often ask, like, okay, well, what's, what's next? What are you working on? Uh, so here's what I'm working on next. The second season of the Nib animated series is out now, and you can see it on YouTube.com or at the Nib. If you're interested, there's a lot more videos. And I'm also working on this uh, graphic novel that comes out in the fall uh, that's basically a polyamorous romance set on a space station after the climate collapse of Earth. It's an uplifting romantic tale. Uh, and I love the art. The art is done by Claudia Aguirre and Eva Cabrera. And it's a really uh, fun story. So tomorrow, I'm doing the zine workshop. I hope you all come. It's here on the Reed campus. And uh, here's who I am. Please keep in touch. That's my whole talk. Thank you. <laughs>